But with that, I think we'll go ahead and start because I want to honor all of your time that did come in um, on time and want uh, welcome to this free workshop on what is this business strategy framework all about. Some of you are a little bit familiar with it. Some of you might be more familiar with it. Some of this is going to be a brand new conversation to some of you. So we thought this would be a really good opportunity for you to learn about the business strategy of framework and what's all involved with it. For those of you that don't know, I'm Joan Wade, the executive director for AESA and have been working with Susan Ledick and Annie Pahacek and Doreen Marvin um, on the business strategy framework, both as a user when I was a CISA administrator in Wisconsin, we implemented the business strategy framework to see how we could grow our business and to make some really critical decisions about our business. Um, and it was very, very helpful in many, many ways that you'll, you'll learn about in just a, a little bit. Um, and now as the executive director for AESA, we've really partnered with uh, Susan Ledek and, um, Duncan Symaster and Andy Pahacek and Doreen to bring this out to more ESAs across the country as a way to grow your business. It, it, it's just amazing to me how we're all educators at heart and we tend to come up through the education ranks, but we don't really know what that inside look of how to make those business strategy decisions what does that look like? We know how to educate. We know how to educate students and we know how to educate adults, but we don't necessarily know how to grow our business. And that's to me what is so important about this business strategy framework. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Susan Ledek and to Andy Pahacek who are going to give you some insider information on what this is all about. And I think Andy, I'm gonna kick it right to you. Thanks, let me just, before I let you start, sorry, let me just say that we're going to be on uh, an hour or less, and it's really important for us to uh, get your questions answered. So while we'll be giving you some baseline information, um, write down your questions, put them in the chat box, and we sure want to make sure that all of your questions get answered uh, as you work through this next hour or so with us. Okay, now, Andy, I'll be quiet and turn it over to you. All right. All right. Well, first of all, let me just say uh, it is good to see all of you. I appreciate everyone taking a little bit of time to uh, jump on and to learn a little bit more about what the business strategy framework is all about. And we're very excited to, uh, to tell you about it. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Andy Pahacek from Houston, Texas. I work for Region 4 Educational Service Center for a little over 10 years. And um, that, and so I'm very very familiar with ESAs and how they work. And then Susan and Doreen and I have been doing a lot of consulting with ESAs across the country. And one thing that we noticed, I think it's fair to say, uh, because ESAs are service organizations, and that is, there's no escaping that and nobody's trying to say that you shouldn't be a service organization. But because you're a service organization, uh, the, the most important asset that you have are your people, and it's the people that are providing those services. And so in a very short, succinct way, I can tell you that the business strategy framework is simply a set of, it's a structure, a framework of questions that will help you uh, make better decisions about how to allocate those resources, and primarily the resources of your people's time. I would bet that most of you would say, there are a lot of opportunities that come our way, uh, but we just don't have the time to take advantage of them because our people are already stretched so thin. And interestingly enough, the word strategy in the business strategy framework, um, strategy is all about knowing what you're gonna say no to. And that's really important. And for me, when I was at region four in Houston, um, our mantra was we never say no. And that actually is a problem because what happens if you never say no is you're always putting out fires and you're not being proactive and you're not proactively thinking about where is the most effective place 
and um, the most effective activity that we can put our people um, on that will generate the, the results that we're looking for. And for us, the results that we were looking for is student achievement. We wanted to move the needle on student achievement. Um, and that doesn't just happen by just responding to every request that comes your way and saying yes, 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 until you run out of people and time. It happens, you move the needle on student achievement um, by being very thoughtful about what you're gonna do and how you're gonna do it and why. And that's what the business strategy framework is all about. It is um, probably a misnomer for you to think if you've heard people talking about it, it will a lot of times, especially with ESAs, be talked about in the, um, in the, in the setting of how to make money. It is definitely effective in helping you uh, make better decisions about how you're gonna spend your time in a way that will help you make money. But regardless of whether you're trying to make money, be profitable, or just put your people on the most effective services you can put them in, um, the business strategy framework is a set of questions that will help ensure that you look at every opportunity from multi-dimensions and you look at the different dimensions of that opportunity and think about Think hard, think more deeply about, um, is this something we should do and why? Is this something we should not do and why? And if, and, and if you decide not to do something, if you get a request from one of your uh, schools and you decide this isn't an activity we should be uh, engaged in, uh, the business strategy framework is not about just saying, yeah, you're on your own, good luck, go find somebody else. Uh, now, we're more about making sure that you think about now, how can we gracefully help without committing our people? And, and, uh, and so we talk about that a lot during the, during the course of the workshop. Um, <clears throat> but simply put, um, I want you to go away with uh, this, the one overarching thought that, that the business strategy framework is designed it's a set of questions, and I will say it's a, a tested set of questions to ensure that um, you think about things more deeply and that you think about things in a way that's going to, that's going to bring insight, and that insight is going to be what's going to help you make a better decision about is this something we should be doing or is it not something we should be doing. Um, we're not saying this is the only set of questions to use or that it's absolutely the best set of questions to use, but it is a way of looking at every opportunity from multi-dimensions to ensure that you're, you're looking at all the dimensions and in a way that has been tested to prove that you, it will generate insights which will help you make better decisions about um, how you should be spending your, the resources that are the most valuable, which is your people's time for the most part. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what it's about and what you should expect to get out of it. Um, Susan, I'll uh, turn it to you to see if you have any color you would like to add to that, but that's uh, kind of my, uh, my quick overview. Well, Andy, I think I'll dig uh, one layer deeper for the note takers on the on the uh, call and get a little bit into the content. How does that sound? Sounds good. Is that okay with everybody? <clears throat> good, good. Good to see you're alive out there. <laughs> um, by the way, if you have questions along the way, please do pop them in the chat or just raise your hand. We're just a small enough group here that uh, we can be pretty responsive. So if, you're, if you were making notes, you would say, hmm, what are those three dimensions Andy talked about that the, um, that the business strategy framework guides you through? And here they are. The first one is create value. The second one is capture value. The third one is deliver value. 
Now, one word got repeated every time. So what was it? Loud chorus, value, okay? So that rhymes very closely with what Andy was saying, that this is about helping you hit mission even better than you are. You want to be delivering services that are of great value to your clients. And you wanna make sure that the resources you're investing to do it are producing the values or the outcomes that you want. So now in your notes, beside those three, let's put some keywords. For create value, please put the word customer or client. Because that's the person who's going to decide if this thing is of value or not. This product or service or training or, or uh, business office operation, uh, they're good. It, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's going to be in the user's eye. Beside capture value, the key word is competitor or competition. And as you're looking through that lens, you're looking out horizontally and asking yourself, who else is trying to do this for these same people? Who else is trying to solve the same problems we're trying to solve? So we're gonna find ourselves in competition with those folks. Beside deliver value or the third dimension or lens, the key word here is partnership or partners. So you see this thing's real people focused. What's happening with your customer? What's happening with competitors? What's happening with potential partners? And so that's the broadest brush stroke I could, I could paint about the content of the workshop. But Andy said this is about frameworks. So let's think a little bit, and he said it's all driven by questions. So let's think about what questions we ought to be asking in each of those dimensions. Well, when you're talking about the customer, there are a few of them, but one is what's the real pain point? What's the problem the customer's trying to solve? Unfortunately, often we've got these great people that Andy referred to and they know a lot. They're our professional staff. They're expert in their fields often. And it's very hard sometimes for them to really listen to the real problem that clients are saying. For example, we worked with an organization, Mr. Burford in your, in your state, where a group of experts had come together to talk about how to handle, how to help teachers deal with uh, kids who are experiencing trauma. And they had a lot of great ideas about how that ought to happen. And it involved a long process, several months of very intensive work. When they put it out there, Unfortunately, the eye of the beholder didn't perceive it quite that way. The eye of the beholder was, I need something right now. I've got behavior issues. I've got learning issues. I need triage. I can't handle six months of intensive navel peering, in, not to insult their work. I don't mean to do that. I'm exaggerating to make the point. But just being able to attend to the urgent problem and to be able to define the pain point the customer's having is a really important first question. What's the problem we're trying to solve for the client? Another important question is, I'm not gonna do all the questions that you would get in the workshop, but I'm gonna give you a couple in each one. Another one is, if you created it, could they, would they recognize it? In the case I just gave you, any one of us could probably have looked at the plan or design 
for that intervention and said, boy, that is solid as can be. If you really want fundamental change. But the customer was not looking for fundamental change. They did not recognize the value. The experts recognize the value, but not the client. So no value was created. And you could try to sell that until next Thursday. And you would have built it, but no one would come. So that question, can customers recognize the value is a really critical one here. Remember, all of that is in that first dimension of create value, focus on the customer. The hey, second part, yeah, Andy? If I could have, before you go to the second part, mm -hmm. one other piece that's included in that first create value section mm -hmm. that is so important, I think, for ESAs. We hear a lot, especially when you go to the ADSA convention and so forth, you hear a lot of people talking about the importance of branding and how important, how important branding is. And the reality is it's important sometimes, not as important other times. We get into helping you understand and think through in the business strategy framework, is, is brand an important factor in this situation or not? And if so, why? And if not, why? And that's a huge piece for ESAs because a lot of times we rely so much on our brand and we're so convinced, well, our schools are loyal to us. If we offer this, they're going to buy it. Not always the case. And there are, and if you think about it, and that's what the framework is designed to do is to help you think through that ahead of time so that you're not surprised when you don't get the response that you think you, you should get. Thanks, Andy. And just think about your own behavior. If you go to the grocery store, to buy salt and you just need table salt, the brand, it, you don't have to have Morton's. You can have a and because there's no real perceived difference among it. So Andy, as Andy said, that's a pretty important one to think about in that first dimension. The second dimension, I'll speed up a little bit here is remember now in this one, we're looking horizontally at, cust at competition, right? So mostly what we're gonna focus on here is whether or not we have a strategic resource. Now, what we mean by strategic resource is a resource over which you have ownership and control a resource that sets you apart from the other providers or competitors, something that you can sustain over time, even if they try to catch up with you. Please keep your ticket with you. Keep your ticket with you, okay, <laughs> whoever that was. And finally, contributes to satisfying the customers. So there are four things you would, four filters you would pass that through. But oftentimes, you know, Andy said, our human resources are our most essential resource, but they are not always a strategic resource. That's a hard pill to swallow because you think about it and it's gotta be something that really your, your people have to be set apart from the competitor if that's the one you're interested in. If you're interested in the relationships that you have. I've always thought ESAs have, have a fairly significant strategic resource in proximity. But the more and more that we do John Carell just services out across the nation, or we do services across the state, outside the region in which we reside, the less that becomes an issue because you're not close to those people physically anymore. So as Andy said, each one of these has a, has a deep thinking process behind it. And what you're looking for when you're asking yourselves these questions 
is to really be tough with yourself and say, are our resources really strategically different from the other providers? Susan and Andy, we have a question in the chat box from Craig Burford. I'm wondering if the business strategy framework addresses the right way to capture that voice of the customer in the value creation dimension. Okay, uh, so Craig's asking that we back up a little bit and we think about that concept of voice of the customer. Just give me a raise of hands if that's a phrase that bounces around your organization. You talk about the voice of the customer. Okay, I see that at CISA 7. I see that a couple of other places. Um, that's a phrase that came out of, believe it or not, the 1980s and the quality movement. And uh, Craig, the right way to capture that voice, I don't think we would say that the framework gives you the right way. What it's going to do is it give you a way to think about what the customer's saying and more important, what the customer is doing and how the customer has behaved. Yep. Right, Andy? Yep. Yep, absolutely. So yeah. that's, that's the key thing to think about there, Craig. I see the thumbs up. That seems to make sense. Okay. Now, I, I will add just a little bit of color there. So when we All were right. at Region 4, we would do a lot of surveys. And I and in the business, so another thing I should add about the way when we do the business strategy framework, um, Green, Susan, and I, we add a lot of um, ESA examples and examples from our own experience, some where we had made good decisions, some where we made bad decisions. And uh, definitely that was one where we would just take surveys or go out and ask people, well, would you buy this if we did it? And what we found was you cannot rely at all on that. It's uh, you have to gauge behavior. And so the business strategy framework does talk more about the behavior and how you go about gauging the behavior, because that's the more true picture of what the customer really values and whether they recognize the value. So the third part of the framework then is partnership. And how many of you would say you have partnerships now with a third party provider? Some, somebody, yeah, most everybody's had some experience doing that, good. So I think you'll relate to the problem that comes up. And there, so there are two questions. What do we need to collaborate on? And that's often the sharing of information, the sharing of resources versus who's, how are we going to split up the money? How are we going to share the revenue? So let's say, for instance, that you have decided that you have, you have identified a really important pain point uh, for teachers in, in the region in which your agency is operating. And you say, boy, we really ought to go for this, but we don't have, we don't have the critical resource. We don't have the critical knowledge needed to build this, to build an answer. So we're going to go find a partner. You're going to find a partner maybe at a university campus. Well, as soon as that happens, what's the progression? Right away, you love each other. Oh my gosh, this is a marriage made in heaven. This person at the university has been trying to get their work out into the field. You're providing a vehicle for doing that. Everything's wonderful. Then second, third, fourth, fifth year, your people are learning something. They're starting now to make their own contributions. You're maybe building out around this person's original work and extending it and expanding it. All of a sudden, there might be a little different pressure for revenue share here. You know, the university professor is still saying, gosh, you've got my basic ideas. And you're saying, yeah, but I've got 14 people we've developed to put on this program and they've added all kinds of added value. That old original deal we made back in year one is maybe not the one we need now. So that's the balance beam in partnership. 
what do we collaborate on and how do we split up the money and we work a lot in the in the course of the framework to say how can you plan knowing that that partnership will change over time and evolve so those are some andy uh, and joan of the the key issues and I think I'll just stop there and Andy, hand it back to you. Okay. So you can either add some things or invite conversation. Okay. Yeah, I would just say that, um, so that quick overview um, may seem like, well, that's pretty simple. It's, uh, and, and it is on the surface, it's not rocket science, um, but it uh, gets a little tricky when you start to try to implement and try to actually think, use the framework when you're thinking through a real life problem or a real life opportunity. Um, it's, it's a little more tricky than you might think. And so that's part of what the business strategy framework workshop is all about is helping you uh, begin to understand how to really implement this framework of questions. Um, and now I quickly we'll say this also. So it's a, like, I'll re repeat, it's a framework for helping you make better decisions about how to allocate your resources. And, um, you know, as, as you start, it will take you longer. And you might think, well, we don't have enough time to think this deeply and this long about every single opportunity and understand that. I'm not uh, saying that you're gonna be great at it day one. This is not something you, you hear one day and the next day you're proficient. It's like anything else, you've got to exercise that muscle. And over time, you can exercise it. And so for those of you who have heard Duncan's semester, he's the professor from MIT that introduced this framework to us. Um, he, can, he can go through the whole framework. If you tell him about an opportunity you have, he is uncanny at, with his ability to be able to hone in on the part of the framework that really applies and say, have you thought about this? And it's just, and he can do it in like a matter of just a few seconds. Now, for all of us, it takes a little bit longer, but the more you use it, the more quickly it becomes part of just your way of thinking. And that's what we're really uh, hoping to um, build with different ESAs is where their people can make, so you have directors, at different levels of the organization that are presented with opportunities all the time. And what I think most leaders would like, wouldn't it be great if your director level folks were, had, were armed with the ability to think quickly about, wow, is this a good opportunity or not? And to think through some of these key strategic questions before they ever even bring it up to the top so that they're already filtering out are thinking about, well, if we did this, we should probably think more in, in this line than that line or whatever. Um, that's where you're headed, but it's not gonna be there day one. You're gonna have to exercise that muscle. And as you do, you will get quicker and it will, and it is possible where well, there are definitely uh, several ESAs that will tell you they are, um, they feel much more proficient at it today. The other thing that it gives you then is a common um, common terms so that when you sit down to talk as a group of leaders about different opportunities, you can uh, refer to the terms that we talk about with the business strategy framework and you're all instantly know that's what they're talking about. Okay, we're all on the same page. We're not talking about two different things. We're not talking about apples and oranges here. We're all talking about oranges <laughs> and we know that uh, because you all have um, that same foundational uh, understanding. And that is so valuable in, in organizations. One last thing that I'll say, and then we'll just see if anybody has any questions is, I think this is effective whether you have one person or you have 500 people, uh, because the, the principles still apply. And it is, and, and the big question is, how should we be spending our time? And that applies whether you're a one person shop or a 500 person shop. So with that, um, that is a, that, that's kind of a quick overview. John, I see you've got a question. 
I always have those people that have a raise hand feature and I always have trouble finding it. So I just did the old fashioned way. The old fashioned way. I love it. <clears throat> One of the things that you, when I've been through Simester's work before is that he's really clear about the fact, I don't remember the percentage, but it's somewhere like over, like only 10% ideas, only 20% of the ideas actually hit or are successful. So you have to create an environment of experimentation and trial and error in your organization that is fostered and developed in order for it to be, uh, in order for you to find those things that really hit. So what can you say about how you create that environment in the organization to have it be set up that way? Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, add my two cents and then uh, Susan or Doreen or Joan, if you guys want to add something. I, so that also requires practice and it's something that you can get better at as you go and i think you first just have to be intentional about the desire to do it to be to become an a um, uh, an organization that engages in experimentation um, and but we do talk a lot about experimentation during the business strategy framework because it's through that experimentation that you see how people behave and that's what we're looking for is that behavior. And, and so, yeah, there's an art to designing good experiments um, and it's not perfect. And that's probably one of the big challenges for educators is we like to get the right answer and we like for it to be the perfect example or the perfect experiment. And uh, the reality is it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna be messy. And there's gonna be some things that aren't exactly um, in line with um, with what you might want to do, uh, but some information, some actual information on behavior is better than saying I think. And we typically at Region Four, I'll speak for us, we're making decisions based on a lot of I think. If we do this, I think people will come. If we offered this, I think people would pay this. If you know those kinds of questions. And it's much better to do that, that experimentation. So thanks for bringing that up, John. Susan, Doreen, anybody wanna add any additional color to that? Yeah, I think John, it's like anything else that you, you want to have really become part of the fabric of how your folks think in your organization, experimentation, controlled experimentation, not just, not just wild risk tanking. We're not talking about that not just throwing stuff on a wall, right. but um, actually testing some theories to, as Andy said, to try to understand what, how people will behave under certain conditions and certain options that you might put forth. But you're gonna do that before you expend a lot of resource and energy. And that's the whole idea with all of this is you wanna get in front of spending that resource. You don't wanna get a whole program developed put it out there and have nobody nobody go for it. And I, I know from our experience that every single one of us has had that experience. That we've put something out, we thought it was great and nobody came to the party. So that's what you're really trying to avoid. That's the idea of, of resource. But the other thing, John, is that it does require modeling by leaders all the way from your office to your program managers. There are different decisions being made at different levels of your organization about what programs to develop, what programs to um, resource, or maybe even what programs to invest your institutional dollars on, um, on whole new innovative things. So um, the modeling, the practicing, the um, development of your own examples from which you can teach, those are all part of enculturating this, we believe. Doreen, what have I missed? Um, I think the, uh, the color that I might add is that I think sometimes we're afraid to do experimentation because we're we think they have to be big and huge. And the reality is that it can be something small. And so you might take um, something I work with an organization right now that is trying to set up a whole new leadership 
strand to the work that they do. And they've never done this before. They've always entered at working with teachers. It's not an ESA. And they were going to expend $40,000 to set up a $4,000 year long program. With, and by the way, all they did was talk to three people who said that they would come. They have no behavior on this. <clears throat> and so it was, well, how might we experiment with this? And they don't have to be perfect experiments. You don't have to have control groups and make it a big research project. It's, huh, I wonder if we offered a one day that was a little pricey and we geared it just towards leaders who lead these, this type of work, would they come and would they pay for it? And that, by the way, won't cost us $40,000. And so it doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to know upfront, what's the data you wanna collect? What is it you wanna learn from it? And I think that's the way, John, you're able to create that culture of experimentation. We appreciate the question, John. What else is on your minds, folks? Yeah, Dan Wilson, I've got you. Yes. Um, I appreciated the introduction that Joan gave and the statement that uh, most folks are educators and kind of grow up as educators. Uh, I'm an exception. I've been a chief financial officer for my entire career. And in Ohio, we have over 600 school districts, some as small as 300 students and then the major urban districts. And a, a fair amount of the districts we serve are smaller districts or under-resourced, have younger professionals in leadership roles. And uh, not to go quite to experimentation, but we in our ESC recognize some of the needs that uh, some of our newer leaders mm -hmm. need to embrace, and yet they don't they don't realize it. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm looking for some guidance on when you know there's a need there, you know you can serve that need, but the customer or the uh, doesn't fully recognize that need. How do you proceed? Andy, I'd like to take a crack at this one first. Um, Dan, oftentimes it's a way to, if, if you work away from need and you ask yourself, what problems are they having? And a good question that you can ask them is, is this one, and this is a good one to write down, is what are, you trying, yeah, what are you trying to do, but having trouble doing it? Sometimes our definition of what they need as a leader doesn't jibe and, and their behavior is telling you that. They're saying that they're not buying what you're offering. So you don't have the problem. Either. There's, classically, there are two problems. Either you haven't solved the right problem yet or you haven't made the solution attractive enough. Now that gets a little into the design world, but I'm not gonna worry about that overlap too much. But I think mostly your problem there is failing to frame the problem in a way that's problem centered for them and not a perceived need from your perspective. But I'd be interested in what my client, my colleagues say here. Andy? Yeah, uh, I would just say that, um... There are definitely times where um, the customer, like think about Apple and when they created the, the uh, iPhone, customers weren't, didn't even know they wanted an iPhone until they created it. And so there are definitely those, those situations. Um, I, I, it is my experience that the business strategy framework and thinking hard about the customer need and where the customers and the customer's perspective will uh, give you a better chance at really identifying some of those kinds of opportunities. Um, because a lot of times customers will ask you for something, but they don't really know what they truly need. They're just asking for the symptom. They're, they're saying, would you solve this problem that is a symptom? And, and so the business strategy framework approach 
causes you to think a little bit more deeply about what they're asking you to do and why they're asking you to do it and what they're actually trying to accomplish. And in doing that, you, um, and it's a structured way of doing that. It's, it's not just kind of willy nilly, it's more of a structured way of, of thinking through that. And in doing so, um, you're more likely to come up with some of those opportunities. And the interesting thing is when you hit on something uh, like that, like Apple did with the iPhone, uh, customers recognize the value pretty fast. You don't have to um, you don't have to jump through hoops to get them to recognize that value. Um, so uh, we do talk about that, and it is uh, a, a big part. Truly, business strategy framework thinking is all about giving you a a, a set a, a framework and a set of questions to help you think more deeply about something, so you can be more intentional and proactive as a instead of, instead of reactive. And so, and, and I, let me add real quick before we um, continue with questions. I think right now for ESAs, there is no more important time than right now for ESAs to begin to think in, the, in these terms because schools for the first time in my memory have lots of money to spend and they're looking for ways to spend it. And I think they're gonna be looking at ESAs to provide help for services with a lot of those funds. And if you just say yes to the first opportunities that come along, you're gonna be probably miss out on, on, on some big opportunities on the back end. Um, you, now more than ever, with the kind of money schools have to spend, you wanna be very thoughtful and deliberate about what activities your folks are engaged in and make sure now's a great opportunity for you to build some services that can really move the needle. Uh, if, if your goal is helping student achievement or something along those same lines, now's the time for you to really look at what are we uniquely qualified to do and what should we be doing? And that, that supersedes whether you're going to make money at it or not. That is just simply a question of what should we be doing to achieve our goals? And um, so that's, that's what we're really talking about. As a, it's just a little bit of background that I would add to a lesson that Duncan always teaches in the premier level business strategy framework. Um, he always talks about the Fortune 500 companies that he works with. So he teaches this framework um, with Fortune 500 companies, Cisco, L'Oreal, AT&T. I mean, he, and he has examples of where they didn't get it right. Uh, and they didn't think hard enough about decisions that they were making. So he always says, you know, just because you're working at an ESA, don't think that you're the only one that don't, do not know how to use this strategy um, or that it doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy to private companies either, but they work hard at it to make sure that they understand and think deeply about the decisions and the strategies that they're making. Um, so I only say that because when you, when you start working within the business strategy framework and you're thinking about all these questions that Andy continues to talk about, you're going to think really hard and you're going to be exhausted at the end of the day because it's a different way. You're stretching your brain. It truly is a different way to think um, and analyze. Are we going down the right path or are we not going down the right path? And for AESAs, we have two different levels of the business strategy framework. I want to get to your questions, but I also want to make sure that we, we get um, so that you know where you can find out where you can learn more. Um, so if I could just uh, share my screen quickly here, I want to show you where on our website you can find information. So if you go to our website, you always see this top navigation bar of things that we do for our members. There's a section now called professional learning. And with, oops, I scroll too fast, sorry. Within the professional learning section, there are categories and you will see the business strategy framework listed there. You can click on that. It'll take you to this page where it talks just what Susan and Andy have been talking about this afternoon, how you get results. The results that are on this website 
our actual program growth and revenue growth that's happened at ESAs that have been consistent with their application of the business strategy framework. It's pretty impressive when you read about that. But our workshops, we have two levels that I was telling you about. One is a practitioner's level workshop. And that is really meant to be for ESAs giving examples of your work, of work of ESAs. And Andy and Susan and Doreen teach those workshops for us. Those workshops are in person. And um, the next one is coming up real quick in October uh, in Kentucky. It's going to be in person in Lexington, Kentucky. The other one is a premier level workshop. And this workshop is a virtual workshop. And because it's virtual, it used to be in person. Uh, Susan and Andy and Doreen and, and have supported Duncan teaching this workshop for very, several, several years, but it was always in person until the pandemic hit. Last year, we did it for the first time virtually and people really appreciated the virtual nature of the workshop because the sessions were shorter and people could really think harder about what they were learning come back and review it with Duncan and then learn the next lesson, and then come back and review it and learn the next lesson. So we did that in a week last year. And we, what we learned from that experiment, we really need to do it over two weeks and spread it out. So there are two hour sessions over two weeks in May that Duncan will be, be teaching. So you can find these, this information on our website. The registration is all there. Um, I just wanted you to be able to find it, as well as other support work that we're doing for our members when you're trying to price services. How do you do that? We have a shorter workshop that Doreen and Andy teach on pricing. We have an entrepreneurial network for ESAs that want to be entrepreneurial and learn from each other. And this year we have three entrepreneurial ESAs that are going to be leading that work and, and you can read about them if you go to our workshop. So I'm gonna stop with that so that you, I just wanted to make sure that you know where to find that information. And uh, you can always contact me if you want more, but I also wanna make sure that we answer any other questions um, with the few minutes that we have left. Any other questions? wondering about. Susan and Andy, how many years have you been doing this with Duncan? Mm, close on 10. If we go all the way back to Andy's first experiences. Yeah. 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 But I think we offered public workshops for seven years uh, through my company. And just uh, full disclosure here. Um, AESA now manage, has the management role over those workshops uh, for the two levels that she described. We also do work, as Andy said, internal to organizations. So, you know, but there are lots and lots of options to learn more about this. Yeah, there are, there are definitely uh, opportunities to customize things for your organization. Um, we've done real deep dive. So when Duncan does his workshop for a Fortune 500 company, a lot of times they will want him to do a deep dive to really help train their future leaders. And so he's got a whole process for doing that. And we have adapted that same approach to ESAs and we've done it in several and they've uh, every, at least as far as uh, from my perspective, it seems like everyone uh, has thoroughly appreciated uh, whenever we've done that. And so there are a lot of different ways we can uh, we can work with you, but the a good way to start is to is to get a team at at uh, one of these workshops. And what you'll find, and I know for me, I've been doing it now for ten years. And whenever I listen to Duncan teach, I'll come up with a little bit new understanding or a little bit deeper clarification of under you know, so that I have a, a better understanding of how to apply the principles, because it just keeps getting richer and richer. Um, there are a lot of layers and um, 
And so it takes a while to be able to digest all of it, but it's so powerful when you do, because it does, you can absolutely feel more confident about the decisions you're making as far as, is this a good opportunity or is this something we should stay away from? Mm -hmm. Really is, uh, really is helpful. I see a question in the chat from Sarita out in Puget Sound um, on ideal team composition for the workshop series. Um, Sarita, we, we always recommend that you have members of your senior leadership team as appropriate. And um, that would be your executive director, your superintendent, your uh, business manager, Dan Wilson. <laughs> we need those people in the room because there are often a lot of support issues that, uh, that wind up getting talked about. If you've got program people for um, strategy, as I know your role is, Sarita, um, and innovation, as some of you have in your job titles, I noticed today, those are also good candidates. I would try for a mix for at least a couple of strong upcoming uh, program leaders. Because remember John Carell's question early, how do you drive this through the organization? You can't just hold it at the top. It, it has to be modeled there, but it also has to be dispersed throughout. Does that help? Yes, she's giving me a thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> thanks for turning on your camera. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, we usually recommend a, a group size of about six, but we have had people who have brought uh, enough for two teams, uh, have brought a dozen people. And so we're quite flexible on that. And you work out the pricing with Joan on that, but she would price that on a team basis. And I think, Joan, there's a team price and then an added individual price. That's correct. Yeah, that's how we've typically done it. So six is kind of the minimum, just so you get that spread that Sarita is asking about, but you take the opportunity to add more folks if you need and want to. I think we probably have time for one more question if there is one or some comments or thoughts from you. Okay, so we're after customer voice through behavior. So um, here's one more. Here's one more. Oh, two more. David Marshall says, are there any options to work with a team other than the workshops? Um, yes, and those would be private consulting arrangements or individual arrangements. Joan would be the contact person and then she would work it out with the three of us about how to handle that. Correct. Um, very often what people do, they come to the workshop and then they say, but I need the support afterward when I go back home and try to make application. And so we are quite, uh, quite willing to do that too, David, that sort of thing. Um, then the other question, does the framework create a planning process? that builds work plans and budgets for future years and guides a shift in core funding sources. Boy, Annie, I'm gonna bounce that one to you. Um, okay. Yeah, so I would say <clears throat> if you're looking for uh, step one, step two, step three process, it, it really doesn't give you that, but it definitely does give you um, a way to think about it ahead of time, uh, to get in front of uh, what happens if we lose our funding? What happens if funding starts coming from a different place? All of that is, is part and parcel to the deeper thinking that you would do with bu the business strategy framework as you consider uh, different opportunities. And so it's definitely a part of it. It, it definitely, um, the, it definitely plays into the results you're going to get. But as far as giving a step one, step two, step three, not so much. Uh, but I don't want to give you the impression that you don't even think about it because it absolutely is a key part 
to the uh, to the overall deeper thinking that you're going to do around any opportunity. Andy, I would also say that um, in, as I recollect going through the business strategy framework when I was at CISA 6, we spent a lot of time within our organization thinking hard about what do we do that's benevolent yeah. and what should we make <clears throat> revenue on and what should we stop doing and why should we stop doing it? And so those are the kind of also financial situations that every ESA finds themselves doing work that's benevolent work and you should be doing, but how do you pay for it? So you've got to have some of the services that you provide that you make enough revenue on so you can do those things that are benevolent. But we never thought about that before. We, we just did it because we had to do it and didn't think about, I'm sure our um, CFO thought about it, <laughs> but as the executive director, it was just well, something we had to figure out and do. And once you go through the business strategy framework, Duncan makes you think of that. And if you do follow up work with Andy, Susan and Doreen, they really can get you into that kind of decision making process as well. Yeah. yeah and, and let me just add. So, so the thing that you're going for when you are using these, this set, this framework and these set of questions is you're basically, I like to say you're on a quest for insights mm -hmm. and you want to find, and when you see an insight, and insight isn't just an observation like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that would like this. That's not really an insight. Insight is something that you didn't, it wasn't obvious before, but once you see it, it's obvious. And, um, and it's a game changer. And when you get true insights around an opportunity, maybe it's if we do this, this is the niche we need to be operating in or uh, we shouldn't do this, but we might should look at doing something similar in this vein. And um, and it's that it's that deeper thinking that uh, will when you find an insight, a lot of the things like the planning process for budgets and so forth will become a lot more obvious. It makes a lot of those kinds of decisions easier because when you when you see a key insight that is a real game changer for whatever opportunity you're looking at, it will guide a lot of the activities around that, that opportunity. And, uh, and you'll just find yourself making a much better decision around all of it. You know, I would also add that another thing the framework does not do is it is not a product and service design process. It's much more about questions you ask yourself before you ever enter a design process. Now, you might be thinking maybe we should do a training for these new, uh, these new administrators as Dan, you know, that example Dan gave us. Um, and that's enough to get you started. Then you start working around in that space to say, well, what problems are they having? What competition is there? What's the competition for their time? And those kinds of questions. So I would not want to give you the impression that you would walk out of this experience with a fully designed product or service. That's not the orientation. The orientation is what happens in front of that before you ever commit to a, a, an intensive design process. Joan, Great. I think we're there. I agree. Thank you very much for uh, spending your time, your valuable time with us. And Susan, Andy, and Doreen, I appreciate uh, your willingness to share your knowledge and expertise with our members. You can all expect a follow-up email from me that will have the, the recorded video of today's session in case you want to share it with anyone else in your organization or you want to see if you missed something. Um, and you will receive links to uh, the registration and further information. And please contact us if you have any questions at all. We certainly want to help. So thank you, everyone.